morning, church. How good was that, eh? We're so lucky at our church that we can just sit back and listen to these items sometimes and reflect. It's just awesome. We've got that kind of, those musicians, it's awesome. Um, my name's Adrian, if you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here. And this month, we've been going through a series focusing on a Bible passage um, in Psalms, Psalms 119. It's a really big passage, heaps and heaps of verses. It's, it's the biggest chapter of the Bible. And this psalm is really a, the, a psalmist. We don't know who it is. We don't know who wrote this psalm. A lot of the psalms were written by David, but we don't know who wrote this psalm. But this psalm, if you could read Hebrew, which I'm assuming most of us don't know how to read Hebrew in the room, if you could, you'd realize that this psalm is an actual, it's actually an acrostic poem using the Hebrew alphabet. So each paragraph or each stanza in the poem, because the Psalms are poems, each stanza starts with a particular Hebrew letter, and then um, it keeps going. So the Psalm that I'm looking at today, or the passage, the stanza I'm looking at, is the, the letter of the Hebrew alphabet is called Mem. So when you're looking at this in the Bible, we don't actually have it on the screen, unfortunately, but when we're looking at this in the Bible, in a, um, Psalm 190, you'll see all these different words that you won't really understand. It's the different letters of the Bible. And so at the beginning of this stanza or paragraph, it starts with mem, and that's the letter. So let's get into it. Psalm 119, let's uh, put it up on the screen and let's read it together. But before I start, I'm going to ask you, so, so often when we read things in the, um, in the Bible at church, sometimes we can switch our minds off and we just read. But what I want you to do as we're reading is Reflect on how this psalm actually makes you feel. What's your first response? What's your reaction? And don't actually think, don't, sorry, don't even feel bad if your response is what it might not be the, uh, the ideal response, okay? Just have, a, just have to think through, be active in this process. So let's read it. It goes for eight verses. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insights than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to, to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. So it's an amazing psalm, and every, every stanza really in 119 is the same message, how much this author loves the law loves the Word of God, loves His commands, loves His precepts, which are like these sayings of God. He loves them. But what was your response? Because I think there are a few common responses. Um, there's probably lots of different types of responses to this passage, but there's probably a couple of common ones. So here are some of the common ones I reckon we have in the room. The first one, I feel the same. I'm exactly the same as the psalmist. I love the word. I love it. It's like honey to my mouth. I consistently have this attitude. Some people will feel like this. Well, I know I should feel like this, but I often actually have a struggle with this, to have this attitude. Some of us might have that. If we're honest, sometimes we might feel like that. Some of us might be like this. I actually feel guilty when I read a passage like that because I don't feel like that or because I might not think like that, or maybe I just feel like I'm doing the wrong thing. The psalmist keeps saying he's doing the right thing all the time. I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing all the time. Um, and then some of us might be thinking here today, well, I don't actually care about God's life, the God's law in my life. And that's, that's a, a thought pattern as well. So there are different attitudes that we come to the Bible. Don't feel bad is that when you read a passage like this or a pastor gets up and says, this is the way we should think, and you don't instantly think like that at that moment, okay? This is, we've got to realize that this passage is the ideal attitude. 
okay? It's the ideal attitude. It's the highest points. It's someone who's obviously spent a long time reading, digesting, meditating on the law, and now they have this attitude. But they did not, whoever this author was, thousands of years ago they wrote this psalm, they didn't just wake up one day having this attitude towards God's word. It doesn't work like that. Um, It's very likely that the author would have gone through years of conscious effort to renew his mind to the point of genuinely thinking, genuinely thinking, not just saying it, but genuinely thinking and acting this way. We don't just wake up. It's like like this in almost every area of life. People don't just wake up one day and go, oh, I'm an elite athlete, awesome. It doesn't work, does it? It takes an amazing amount of effort. We don't just get um, into the kitchen and for the first time be an amazing cook. It doesn't work like that. You've got to put the effort in. You've got to put the practice in. We don't, men who are husbands, you don't wake up one day and just suddenly be your consistently thoughtful husband all the time. It doesn't happen like that. It's possible, but you've got to put the effort in. Um, There's so many areas of life like this. In business, you don't just wake up one day and you've got a successful business. It takes time. It takes effort. There's this famous quote that it says, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. These things don't happen straight away. And it's the same with discipleship, okay? It's the same with discipleship. It's the same with how much you might like the reading the Bible. These things take time. Sometimes people just instantly have an amazing love for God's Word and that's it. That's the rest of their life. But a lot of people, it will take time, effort, Um, and diligence, and it's got to be a choice, okay? It's got to be a choice. So, um, when we read a psalm like 119, we need to realise it's the ideal attitude. But so often, we read things like this, or we hear messages that talk about the way we should think and act and live, um, and our first thought is guilt, or our first feeling is guilt, and that guilt can so often cripple us to actually making that next step, to making that change. Has anyone made, um, has anyone been sitting off, sitting around watching Australian Ninja at the moment? Anyone watching Australian Ninja? It's such a, <laughs> I don't know why we're watching it, Danielle, but, <laughs> um, but if you don't know it, it's these amazingly sculpted bodies just going through these obstacle courses, and it's just amazing what the human body can do. Now, it's enjoyable to watch, but you could sit and watch this show, maybe while you're eating chips or like a, <laughs> an apricot pie or something like that, and you could, um, you could go, well, what's the point of me even living a healthy life when I don't look like that? It's like that, isn't it? We look at that and go, ah, oh, there's no point, there's no point me even trying to be healthy because I don't look like that right now. And it's the same thing when we read some of these Bible passages. Sometimes we go, well, that's not my attitude now, so I'm not even going to try. Um, or I'm not like what the pastor's saying now, so, and it's too far, the gap is too far between that reality and my reality, I can't even bother trying. Um, But when we watch Australian Ninja, it can actually inspire us to get off the couch and do something. When we hear messages, when we read the Bible, we can actually make that next step, okay? We can do that. Um, So, today, I'd like us, for this time, to actually try to stop thinking about how we might measure up to um, the Christian life or how we might measure up to, say, the, the commandments of God. The guy, the psalmist, he obviously loved the commandments. He said it. He loved it. He, he thought it was the best way to live. But let's try not to try to measure ourselves on what we do. What I want us to do is I actually want us to analyze our attitudes towards God's Word, our attitude towards His law and His commandments, and our attitude say, to, say, the teachings of Jesus because it's actually our attitudes which will dictate what we actually do. It's our belief systems and our value systems that will actually help us outwork um, any kind of 
thing in, in, um, in our life. So why are we, if you're Christian here, now if you're not Christian here, you can just sit back and listen. That's all you need to do. But as Christians, we, there's, there's a reason why we follow the teachings of Jesus. There's an actual reason for it. Let's analyze what it is. Why do we follow the teachings of Jesus? Why should we aim to do the things that God wants us to do? Um, here's something I found. I'm a teacher, and so I'm always looking around asking um, how we can do things better. And I found this a, um, a particular school in the UK uses this pyramid. And they try to encourage their students, and I think they do pretty well because it's one of the the most um, strictest schools in the UK, they say. So I think this is one aspect of their, say, behaviour management system. And they are trying to encourage the students why they might choose to do the right thing at school. Why should they follow the rules? And there's, there's ultimately multiple reasons for it. The first reason, I guess, right at the bottom is, I'm going to follow the school rules because I don't want to get a detention. That's kind of the base level. I don't want to get in trouble, so let's not follow, let's um, make sure we follow the rules. The next step would be, I want to actually get rewards. They do these things called merits. Sometimes teachers might give points out or stars or if they're really lucky, chocolate. Um, and so I want to do the right thing because I want to get a reward. Um, and so that's the reason why students might do what they're doing. The next one is, it's a bit hard to see, sorry. I want to build trust and actually impress my teachers. I like my teachers, I want to actually, imp I want to impress them, I want them to see that I'm doing the right thing. The next le level is, I've, I've worked out that if I follow the school rules and listen and try hard, that I'll, I'll have a great future. And so the school rule, there's, a, there's logic to the school rules because it's actually gonna help me in the long run. And then the last level is, I want to do the right thing because it's just who I am. And so they are encouraging their students to climb up this mountain or climb up this pyramid, saying that, sure, if you, at the moment, you might just be doing the right thing to get out of detentions, but ultimately, we want to try to follow this way of living because it's who we are. Okay, so that's what their, their thought pattern is. And the, when I've been reflecting on this, I can see how sometimes we can actually see our relationship with God like this a little bit. Um, that there are sometimes different patterns of ways or reasons why we might actually follow um, the teachings of Jesus. So, if we just flick to the next one. So, base level is we might, if we really just analyse why we might have come to Christ or why, why we might be listening to um, the teachings of Jesus, is we just simply want to avoid going to hell. A lot of people in the 70s um, the basic message of the pre preaching was, make sure you commit your life now or so you can avoid going to hell. And it's a legitimate reason, isn't it? It's a legitimate reason, um, but my belief is Christianity is a relationship, isn't it? It's a relationship with Christ. It's a relationship with God. I wouldn't want any other relationship be, to be, well, I'm, I'm in this relationship because I'm afraid to go to hell, um, so I'll, that's why I'm in it. Um, and so I think we should, it's legitimate, but I think we should move past it. And so I guess the next step could be, why well, I want to um, go to heaven. You're not trying to flee from something, but you're trying to run towards something. I want to go to heaven. Um, I, and because heaven is where God is at. Next step could be, why well, I love God. Uh, it's not really about the destination where I want to end up. It's actually what I'm doing today, and I love him, and I want to please him, and I want to do the things that he wants me to do. Uh, the next step could be, well, I've, I've realised that the God's way of life is actually the best way to live. It's the best way, the, the practical consequences. And sometimes I find myself thinking like this, is that sometimes I'm like, well, ultimately, this is literally the best way to live. Um, it's very practical. And at last, up the top is, well, it is who I am. It is who I am. Now, let me just be clear. The amazing thing about grace is when you commit to Christ, you are on the top straight away. God sees you as a child of God. It is who you are, okay? There's no amount of climbing up the pyramid or the mountain um, to, to please God anymore. 
to earn his favor, to earn his grace, to become a better child of God. He already sees you as holy and blameless. He actually, this is who you are. Um, and so we can almost flip the pyramid. You start out as that. Um, it is who I am. It is who I am. And it's the Christian message or discipleship is outworking that reality in our lives. Um, and so that is the big thing. But in reality, it's hard to, it's, it's not an instant thing. You might, it's true. It's who you are. You are a child of God. God loves you. You don't need to earn his love. It's true. But it takes a while for that to sink in, doesn't it? For some people, that takes a long time to sink in and actually outwork that in reality. And so, I'm quite interested in this process. And so, um, in, in some of my study and, and whatnot, I've, I came across a group of psychologists that have actually, they in the 60s, the late 60s, they defined this process of taking a new belief system or a new idea and actually internalizing it so it actually becomes reality in someone's life. Um, and so there's some overlapping stages, and it's just a definition, it's not, it's not um, hard and fast. But um, here, here it's kind of how it works. So uh, the first thing is just, just use this idea, is you're a child of God, God loves you. you. There's nothing you need to do to earn his love. That's the idea, okay? At the first stages is you just don't listen to that. Now, you don't listen because you've never heard it, or you don't listen because you actively choose to dismiss that idea. Um, and so that's really the, the base level of it. The next step is you're listening to it, you actively hear it, you actively hear it, or you're reading it in the Bible, because when you read the Bible, you hear it, this is through and through, God loves you. He sent his son to die so he could have a relationship with you. So when we're, you're hearing it, you're reading it, but you don't actually do anything about it. You're just listening. Okay, the next step is you actually make, the word is conform, but you actually you start doing something about what you're hearing. So you're conforming in something. It's, you're probably you're active, but you don't really know why, but you're actually making a response. You're hearing this idea of God's love in your life, and you're, you're responding to it. The next level would be commitments. At commitments, you've actually acknowledged, you've accepted that this idea is good, valuable, helpful, and I actually am going to commit to it for the rest of my life. I'm going to try my hardest. And so I guess that's when it's lost. And this, this has happened. This is relevant for many areas of life. But for this idea, at some point, you committed to this idea. You've, you've accepted that God loves you. And that's going to change the way that you're going to live. Um, the next level, organization, really just means what these people are saying is that we have many, many values in life. We have many different beliefs. We've got many different kind of uh, belief structures, principles. Um, and organization means is you're actually, it's the process of prioritizing those values, putting them in order. What, because we're, we're, we've got so many different conflicting values in this world, and we're actually organizing to the point, you've made a commitment, but it's then that next step of how much of this commitment am I going to make, let me run my life? How much am I going to take hold of this commitment? And so that's the organization level. And the last level, this characterization, it's a bigger word, but really it just means you've got to the point that you've internalized this idea so much that it's become your character. It's actually who you are now. This idea that you, the, of God's love, is a, it's actually changed within you, um, and now you're a new person. And so it's a process. I thought it was actually quite helpful to see this process. Like I said, it's overlapping, and it does, not everyone goes through this process. But um, as Christians, if you're here today, and you would you want to be a disciple of Christ, really, I would say that we want to move from conforming to committing to characterization. We want to move through that process. We don't want to get stuck 
at just conforming. Because, man, it's easy, especially if you've grown up in the church, to be stuck at just conforming. You're just doing things because that's kind of what you have to do. People say, well, this is how you'd be a Christian, well, that's why I'm going to be doing it. And so, what is the difference between conformity and commitment? What's the difference between conformity and commitment? Um, there's lots of different descriptions. We're going to look at it a little bit in the Bible, but here are some potential th- thought patterns um, on how do you know if you're only conforming? Well, it's I conform if I'm only doing something if someone's watching. If someone that I respect is watching, then I'll behave in a particular way. But if no one's watching, I'm going to behave a different way. Um, I only do something when someone tells me I should do it. If you're if only following instructions and nothing else, if you're not actually thinking through, why am I doing, why is this a good thing for me to do, um, then it might be conforming. Um, I only do something if I'm going to get something in return. Like that, py- that pyramid showed. If we Sometimes, we're, like I said, we're at the top of the pyramid, but sometimes we voluntarily walk down and, start be- and we're in a different system. We're like, oh, actually, no, I have to. Yes, I know God loves me, but I really have to. I'm really wicked, and I do the terrible, terrible things, and I never listen to Him. Well, I'm gonna have to, I have to prove myself. I have to prove my love. You walk down the pyramid, and you're in a different stage of life. You, you're only doing something to get something in return. You, have to, you feel like you have to earn that love again. Um, and then sometimes it's only doing the bare minimum. Now, there were a group of people when Jesus were around, very, very religious, and they were called the Pharisees. These Pharisees thought that if they could follow the letter of the law and they could convince all the people of Jerusalem and um, all the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, to follow the letter of the law, then that's when God would come and restore Israel. And so that was their motivation. If everyone conforms to the letter of the law... God will come and restore Israel and we'll have our own land and all the temple and all of those different things. And so they certainly did conform to the letter of the law, but they really still didn't have the essence of the law inside of them. And that's what Jesus had such a problem with. Um, And so when we see passages like the Sermon of the Mount, he's taking the letter of the law and expanding it right out. And so let's watch... Um, let's see what he does here. So you've seen these passages plenty of times, I'm sure, but Jesus uses this pattern, this, these, this structure. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. That's the law. That's the commandments. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. What we do with our anger matters It's not just about following the, you won't murder someone. It's what are we actually doing with our anger? That matters. Um, You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What you think about matters. It's the same thing. The letter of law, don't commit adultery, but what you actually think about matters. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He flips it. It's not just about loving the people who are nice to you. It's also about loving the people who are mean to you. The people who have done that, who said that terrible comment that you can't get over. We can still love those people. We still ought to love those people. That's the law. That's the essence of the law. The the Pharisees were conforming to the letter of the law, but Jesus is saying it's much bigger and more important and way way better when we actually follow the spirit of the law. Um, So that's um, so often when we hand over our anger, when we hand over our thought life, when we hand over our offenses, we can actually start seeing people the way that God does. The Pharisees walked around high and mighty, because they were conforming to the law. But at the same time, they were not loving the people around them. When we boil down God's law, Jesus did this a couple of times, when we, when we sum up the whole, Lord, the whole law of, the, of, of Moses, when we boil it right down, the essence of it is loving God, loving people. 
And the Pharisees were conforming to the law, but they didn't actually let the law change them within. They didn't actually start loving people. So commitment, when we decide that we actually want to commit to the ways of Jesus, commit to, the, to his teachings, we actually see the value of God's way of life, and consequently, we decide to start consistently adjusting our behavior. And I know many, many of you have committed to this way of life. But what's the difference between commitment and characterization? What's the difference of, yes, I say it with my, my, my mouth, I've committed to Jesus. But how, what, how do we then go from that commitment to actually letting it transform the way that we live, to make it actually part of our character? So there's a process between commitment and characterization, which involves prioritizing one value over another value. We might have actually committed to a particular belief system, way of life or attitude, but it takes time for those values to internalize to, point, um, to the point where our desired beliefs control our behavior. And it's because we're all walking contradictions. We all have multiple value sets that we are all trying to hold together, but they all conflict. There's these conflicting values, and we have to, it's deciding that one value is better than the other value. We have actually got to prioritize these things. So we see it in all areas of life that we need to uh, move from commitment to actually making it who I am. At the moment, um, Danielle and I have been married four years. Now, I am certainly not a morning person. Okay, I'm going to put it right out there. I'm not a morning person. It's not who I am. Now, in the first year of our marriage, I tried to commit to who I was. Okay, I tried to say, no, um, it's okay that I'm not a morning person. It's, it's good for me to just be who I am. And, but Danielle's certainly a morning person, um, like a crazy morning person. <laughs> um, and so in my first year, I would just sleep in like a normal person, what I thought, like eight, nine o'clock. <laughs> She'd be up at like 6.30, so I'm thinking, who is this person getting up so early? She's singing, who's this sloth? They're always in bed. And so there's obviously a little bit of conflict. We, it was nothing really, but it was a little bit of like, um, but I have decided, I guess over a period of time, that watching her live, that she's actually, her way of living in this particular way is better. Morning people are more productive, as simple as that. They're more and more productive, especially as teachers, maybe in other fields in life. But as teachers, morning people um, are more productive. And so for a while there, I was conforming to this idea that morning, like I was like, because I was like, oh, well, it's, it's going to be easy just for me to get up. So I, start, I was conforming. I just started getting up. But now, you know what? I commit. I've committed. It's a better way to live. I want to get up early, maybe not on the weekends or on the holidays, but when I'm working, <laughs> when I'm working, I want to get up. And so I've been studying, we've been getting up pretty early, like 5.30 kind of early. And um, now, get, let me be clear, I've been getting up at 5.30. This is a big thing. If you knew me before Danielle, it was a huge thing. <laughs> but this is where I'm trying to make this point is I've committed that I want to get up early, but Danielle goes away for even one night, and what do I do? Revert straight back to who I was. <laughs> and I'm a lazy sloth, and I wake up, and then I rush to work, and all of those things. It's not a good way to live. So I haven't made that process from commitment to characterization. It hasn't changed who I am. I wonder, it's been three years since I've made this commitment, and it's still so hard. She'll go away in a couple of weeks to camp. I'm going to be sleeping in. It's going to happen. Um, <laughs> But uh, I would like to. So it's a process, okay? It's a process. In all parts of life, it's a process. But we've got to take our commitment and in a series of steps, move to the point where it actually becomes who we are. We've got to take the commitment of God loves me and it should change the way I live. And it's a series of steps to actually change who we are, okay? So that's that process of characterization. And so there's so many different... Values. I had values on my commitment of um, 
I want to be productive in life, too. Bed is so nice. I had to bring that priority up. And there are so many different examples. Let's have a look um, of this happening. Let's just keep moving ahead. Yeah, here we go. So, priority, prioritizing values. So, here are a few that we all kind of have to go through, a lot of us. Telling the truth, but risking offending someone. Or lying to avoid social awkwardness. We have this all the time, don't we? We might be at work, our boss comes to us, they're temperamental. A lot of us, who has a temperamental boss? <laughs> a lot of us have temperamental bosses. They come to us, they have this harebrained idea, which is not a good idea, and they, and they ask your opinion. You've got a choice. Well, I can tell the truth and offend this temperamental boss, or I can lie or not tell the truth, so avoid that awkwardness. We go through it all the time, don't we? With these two values, like that we don't want to have social awkwardness, but we should tell the truth. We've got to prioritize them. Um, we want to, as parents, I see this every day at school, is we, parents come and they want to protect their children from harm. They want to protect them from harmful situations, but they also want to encourage their child to be independent. There's that tension, that conflict sometimes. And so, um, what do we do with that? Um, if, you're, if you're a manager, you've got a choice. You can trust your staff and let them do their job, hands off, but you risk underperformance. Or you can micromanage your staff to make sure they're doing the right thing, but then you're risking disempowerment. So there's that tension, and we've got these values in our life that we need to choose every day, hundreds. We make hundreds of decisions every day, and we have to prioritize our values. And so when we come to the Bible, when we decide, I'm going to commit to the teachings of the Bible, we have this as our value, but the world have all these other values. Society, the media push all these other values onto us. Uh, it's a process for us to go, this is, the, this is the Word of God, this is the law of God, this is what society is saying, I'm going to actively put the Word of God first. That's my priority. Um, and so let's go to our next slide. So when we make a commitment, there's lots of different things we can do. When we want to be like Christ, when we want to be Christ-like, when we want to imitate Him, we can make these commitments. I'm going to be an honest person. I'm going to be a generous person. I'm going to be a patient person. I'm going to be a compassionate person. In isolation, they're amazing things, aren't they? But when we put an event that comes across against one of these things and we have that decision, sometimes we might, have to, we might feel like we have to tell the lie. There's no other way than telling the lie. We, sometimes we need to be, we have gener generosity, but then we also want financial security. What do we do? I'm going to be a patient person, but that imbecile cuts me off. In the, on the, <laughs> like, what are we going to do? We've got to make um, these choices. I'm going to be a compassionate person, but that devil child at school keeps hurting my child. <laughs> what am I going to do? Like, it's these decisions that we got to keep on having. It's not just in the way that we act. It's also the way we see ourselves. I've been banging on today. God loves you. We don't need to earn that. We've got it. We've got it. But the way we see ourselves sometimes need to come alive. We need to place what, how we see ourselves and how God sees ourselves and ultimately need to put the way God sees us. So I'll give you an example in my own life and then we'll be wrapping up. My parents um, broke up when I was about 13, year eight, terrible time, unfortunately, because new school, new friends, now a new reality at home. So it happens, though, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it happens. It shouldn't happen, but it does happen. Um, and so I'm living through that um, reality. I'm going through school, and unfortunately, one of the big consequences of divorce is that you no longer have that team, um, team like helping, guiding the children. My, unfortunately, my parents both loved me amazingly and were civil. They weren't civil. Some divorces are not civil. My parents' divorce was civil. They still could be in the same room, but they weren't a team. 
And so I grew up as a teenager, um, kind of doing things I probably shouldn't have been doing, but, um, and I was, I was able to get away with a lot of stuff because that, there wasn't a team there. And so once I got into my 20s, reflecting, into, reflecting on my teenage life, I started blaming that it's because I was a child of divorce, that's why I am the way I am. Because I, I didn't do very well at school, it's because I was a child of divorce. If only there was a team at home guiding me through school, I would have then done better. I've got these bad habits. If only if that was a, if I had a team at home, they would have been able to bang up some of those bad habits out of me. I kept on having this thought that I'm a child of divorce. I used it as an excuse. It was a value, wasn't it? It's a value. But I'm also a child of God. And ultimately, that's my identity. I'm not a child of divorce. I'm a child of God. So it's much, much better. And so it's that prioritizing. The way we see ourselves, there's some thoughts in your head that have been there for a long, long time because someone told you them and you've held on to them, but they're not true. But you've been holding on to them higher than your reality of Christ. So it's time to switch, okay? It's time to switch those and start seeing yourself the way God sees you. Um, and so that's my big encouragement. And it's hard, but God is there for us, with us, guiding us. The Spirit of God, this is not just psychology, the stages of internalizing a belief. Sure, it's interesting, but it's not the reality. For Christians, we have the Spirit of God guiding us through this process, but we need to rely on Him. We need to rely on Him. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you so much that when we start delving into your word, we come to realize that it is the best way to live. We come to realize how much you do love us, how much you do care for us. And I thank you when we start pouring ourselves into this and meditating on this truth, we can come to the point where we really, really value your word. We really, really love your word. But I pray for everyone in this room, I pray for anyone who's feeling like they haven't been measuring up or they don't feel like they have this love of God. I thank you that you are here to release that guilt from them, that you're here to just guide them in their next step. They don't need to be crippled by guilt, but show them their next step. Show them the next step that they might need to take on their walk with you. I thank you so much that you love us and you want to remind us that you love us. You sent your son to die for us so we can have relationship with you. And so I pray for anyone in this room right now. They might be hearing these words. I pray for anyone here right now. If there's anyone here that wants to now say, I commit to this. I commit to the way of Jesus. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I've been listening, I've been listening, I've been listening. But today, I am going to commit. I pray for anyone in the room who's, who's had thought patterns that are not healthy, that something's been spoken to them that they've been holding on to for so long. I pray that we can switch that thought pattern to reprioritize our values and see our, ourselves the way that you see us. So I thank you so much that you care for us, love us, guide us, convict us. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.